one way, it means it's the end of the debate for the skeptic. Now, if we look at the Gnostic Gospels, we can compare the difference between the four Gospels. And we can find that when the Gospels mention, um, for example, in contrast, we find the Gnostic texts do not anchor Jesus in historical time. For example, Pilate is not mentioned at all. Galilee comes only once in the Gnostic text. As for biblical Gospels, Pilate appears about 60 times. And I could go on and on and on about more information about that. So the Gnostic Gospels show that they have no real historical integrity whatsoever. Then finally, we find that the Gospels are rooted in eyewitness material. Richard Balcom says, it is the contention of this book that in the period up to the writing of the gospel, gospel traditions were connected with the name and known eyewitnesses, people who had heard the teaching of Jesus from, Jesus from his lips and committed it to memory, people who had witnessed the events of his ministry, death, resurrection, and themselves had formulated the stories about these events that they told. These eyewitnesses did not merely set going a process of oral transmission, that soon went its own way without reference to them. They remained throughout their lifetime a source that may have varied for figures of central and more marginal significance. The authoritative guarantors of the stories they continue to tell, Richard Balcom, Jesus and the eyewitnesses, the gospel as eyewitnesses, Grand Rapids, Ehrman, 2006. Uh, in Richard Balcom's book, uh, basically, he's challenging the form critics. The form critics would say, and a lot of skepticism would say, that Jesus developed as a myth by a competing number of storytellers, principally in the plural. There were these communities, who we don't know who they were, who wrote these stories about Jesus and that's how things developed. In noting the historical research of Papias, who's mentioned by Eusebius, and Papias mentions that he talks to the daughters of Philip and tries to get eyewitness material about Jesus Christ. Balcom also notes in ancient bibliography uh, ancient historiography that since Polybius, uh, Polybius in 200 BC or maybe a bit more believed that if you're going to be a good historian you had to look at eyewitness material. So based on these two researches, one uh, Papias and Eusebius, two uh, the research done on how ancient historians work uh, based on Burridge's book and also, if you look at the four lectures of um, Dr. Balcom at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary on the Gospels as history, you'll get an understanding of this debate. So what you find is, because of this research, there's a strong case that the Gospels are based on eyewitness material. You can see this in the Gospel of Mark, and this is quoting uh, Richard Balcom. Mark writes in a similar way to historians of his time. He uses the narrative methods of inclusio, a historical method of his time. Peter is made central in this inclusio, which means it is, was the eyewitness material being, etc. You can go into in-depth look at this in Richard Balcom's book. <clears throat> so, Basically, I've provided
a simple a couple of simple arguments number one the gospels are in the first century this is seen by the 19,000 quotes of the early church fathers from the second century and so cannot be denied we've seen secondly that based on the research of people like um, Richard Bauch this material and that we have to respect the authors as being trustworthy we also saw that the resurrection in a, a large variety of uh, religious literature both from the first and second century have a consistent story of a Jesus dying and rising which points to a clear historical narrative that could not have been invented nor could have developed over time because there's so much cross-referencing of different historical documents, religious documents. So, it's a broad argument. It's a broad argument that I'm bringing based on Balcom's book Jesus and the Eyewitnesses so here's some of my other thoughts in Mark chapter 14 verse 66 and 72 we know that the gospel is based on Peter's testimony. Why would Mark put in Peter's denial of Jesus if it did not happen? Also, why would Peter be a coward at the time of Jesus' death? So, sorry. Here's my conclusions of this evidence. We've given the depth of the evidence of the historical variety of the gospel, veracity of the denied witness. Now, here's the conclusion of what what that gives us, what that helps us on the table. In Mark chapter 14, 66, 72, as we know that the gospel is based on Peter's testimony, why would Mark put in Peter's denial of Jesus if it did not happen? From Balkan's work we know and from early tradition many other sources we could go into if we wanted to we know that the Gospel of Mark was written on the basis of Peter's testimony so as we know that why is it why is Mark put in the denial of Peter why put it in if it didn't happen it would or propaganda so it has a strong historical base also why would Peter be a coward at the time of Jesus death and be bold in preaching in Jerusalem if Dr. Pryor says that the myth of Jesus that he wrote from the dead started right at the beginning why go into Jerusalem and preach because you'd soon be found out to be a liar what changed Peter from being a coward to courageous? The account of Jesus' death has a ring of historical truth about it. In Mark chapter 16, 9, Mary Madeleine, a woman of ill repute, is the first to bear witness of Jesus. Why make a woman who has only half the testimony of a man in Jewish court, why make a woman the first witness of Jesus? In Mark, we learn that Jesus died on a cross in Mark 15, 25, 37. He was buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea in Mark 15, 43. And he was seen in the resurrection by Mary Madeleine. This resurrection is stated a bold resurrection of Jesus. What 
what is interesting these facts that we affirm are facts that the vast majority of scholars would agree with they wouldn't disagree with that they might not agree with the supernatural interpretation but they would not disagree with the basic facts that Christ died the tomb was empty and the church preached a resurrected Christ so our research and our study confirm are confirmed in what scholars already accept it falls in line with the work done by E.P. Sanders so if our historical source material is in the first century if it's reliable and based on eyewitness accounts if it fits the historical context and accords with the scholarship of more scholars I conclude the following the idea that the disciples were lying makes no sense with the facts that we know why lie what would they gain in lying what would they gain in doing that they gain no money no sex no power people who start new movements aim at those three things the disciples were not aiming at any of those things if you were lying why would you invent that your messiah died was a criminal that died as a criminal how would that enhance what you were trying to do people would have just seen it as silly so why preach it if they lied the enemies could have produced the body of Jesus and that would have exposed them and why again preach in Jerusalem your lies they would have been exposed in no time how come nobody if they were lying how come not one of them recanted when the disciples of him said they saw the golden plate some later on went on to recant but what about delusions maybe they had an illusion or a vision well it goes against the historical fact that the early church disciples believed in a physical resurrection if it was an illusion or a vision why do they insist on a real resurrection why not just say they had a vision why teach it was a physical resurrection if it was an illusion how could they recover from their defeat when Jesus died the disciples were defeated they were not in a psychological fit state to respond to any vision or anything they were utterly defeated they had been beaten by this they were not in a fit state to have visions they were or to have grief illusions as they were so disappointed so lost so shattered they were in no mental state to be to induce any such phenomena then the other option is Jesus could rise from the dead it fits all the historical facts it makes perfectly clear why Peter was a coward one minute and bold the next it makes sense to put Mary as the first witness because she just was it happened it makes perfect sense the disciples Jesus rose from the dead as they were crushed by Jesus death and were not expecting anything and then the next minute they could be bold it makes perfect sense and that's why Mark told it you might say miracles do not happen but that is just a philosophical argument and if you were honest you would say the only way to know if a miracle happened is to check the historical data
You might say there are minor contradictions within the Gospels on the historical resurrection. Those historical contradictions are only a way of looking at the Gospels. What about where all the Gospels agree on various historical facts? What about the fact that these so-called contradictions are really just a that one gospel says one angel, another gospel says two angels, another gospel says a man, is obviously looking at things from a different perspective. If I say there was one angel at the tomb and my friend says there were two angels, if, they, if I say there was only one and my friend said there was only two, that would be a contradiction. But if I say there was one angel and my friend says there were two angels, I'm not being dogmatic, I'm just giving you a general statement. So when you say there are contradictions in the Gospels, you're putting words in the mouth of the Gospels. You may say that Christianity came from Greek and Egyptian gods, Plutarch's Greek and e Egyptian uh, gods shows there is no there was no belief in a dying and rising God that was central that could have influenced Christianity. Mary Jo Sharp, a good scholar, has done a number of lectures on this, showing that um, these ideas are not palatable, have no real historical basis whatsoever. In conclusion, I believe that there is a strong case here for the resurrection of Christ. I believe it's important to consider it. Anthony Flew said, the evidence for the resurrection is better for claimed miracles in any other religion. It is astoundingly different in quality and quantity. Gary Habermas, my pilgrimage from atheism to theism, an exclusive interview with former British atheist professor Anthony Flew, available from the website Biola University, www.biola.edu.edu. So we've, we've come to the end. Um, I've done this lecture before and I've said at the end of it, it doesn't prove the resurrection, but it gives you good evidence for it. I would reconsider my statement. I would say um, that that is in one uh, lecture. Or other lectures I've given more detail, so uh, I've said that there is solid proof for the resurrection. Um, but what I would say here is if you take the presuppositions, the package of the worldview, and the data itself, you have solid grounds to believe that Christ rose from the dead. Those are my conclusions. I just want to finish with some reflections on this. In the minimal fact approach, you normally go to the minutiae detail of the resurrection uh, of the cross and give evidence for that, and then the empty. In this argument, it was a very simple three pronged argument show that the Gospels are early source material, that is to say, first century, show that the Gospels are historically reliable and then generally trustworthy, and then three, show that the Gospels are based in eyewitness material. Show that this information has been consistent in the historical documents from the first and second century.
and therefore you have a strong case that Christ rose from the dead based on those facts. It's a broader approach than the minimal fact approach. All the other views that would come against my view, such as um, Richard Carrier, Dr. Price, Bart Ehrman, none of these competing views would cover all the facts, like like um, the resurrection. So the Christian faith is in a very strong position in its proof that Christ rose from the dead. Um, again, I think that the debate has to be on the grounds of data and presuppositions. And I take a more nuanced position. I, I, I take presuppositions and facts go together. They can't be separated. So that's my um, talk today. Um, you can go and read Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by uh, Richard Balcom and um, basically the heart of the evidence is, is from that book really. Uh, the Minimal of Fact Approach, you can look at The Resurrection of Jesus by Dr. Lycona, IVP. Uh, presuppositions and worldview, you can look at Cornelius Van Til if you go on Presuppositional 101. Go on the website, you'll be able to download presuppositions, uh, um, books on presuppositional apologetics. Um, so these are my thoughts and uh, I hope they've been a stimulant to you and I've kind of just gone over some of my ideas. I know that maybe it's over your head because we're talking about a lot of things in the academic world and a lot of philosophical and theological and historical ideas. But I did spend a lot of time on some of these issues because I wanted to get it off my chest. I thought there were issues that needed to be stated that are not being stated online, that are not being stated by websites, that are not even being stated by professional academics. So I, I spent some time uh, on some issues because I felt that it's important. I haven't given a lot of time on data, but I think that I paint a broad brush that would, should encourage you to believe in Christ and to not be intimidated by other people's beliefs who would criticize yours. you to go and study the scholars that are mentioned and um, you know learn about the subject and engage in the subject if you can. So I'm going to invite you to come to know the Lord. If you want to know Jesus today, you want to believe in him, trust in him, follow him, then I'm asking you to believe in him today. I'm asking you to come to know him as your Lord and Savior. I'm asking you to trust in him, to believe in him. That's what I'm asking. So let's come before the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your blessings. We give you the praise. We give you the glory today. And so, Father, we pray that you be with us now. Bless this lecture and may people come to know you as Lord and Savior. So, Lord, I pray that you would bless in the name of you, Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us all. Bless every individual that watched this video. And may we all come to know you as our Lord and Savior. We praise you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Okay, I think that's it now. I think I'm going to make a cup of tea now, folks. And uh, so I'll leave... I'll leave the uh, 
comment section open please feel free to make comments if the comments are stupid if they're abusive then you will be banned from the channel so it's up to you if you want to engage in debate and discuss then write your arguments down in a week's time I'll come back and I'll, I'll give you my thoughts if you just put abuse uh, you'll be banned straight away so uh, this is an opportunity for me to drop out or uh, if they want to debate and discuss put your comments there and your arguments and I'll come back to you in a week's time uh, I'll make another video rebutting any arguments that might drop out or any atheist out there might want to put on I'll make a video uh, rebutting what anybody said all right so it's an opportunity for atheists to come back and skeptics to come back and uh, say what they have to say uh, on the issue all right thank you for listening and God bless you feel free to mirror this video if it promotes debate and discussion and uh, God bless you all today